Hi, I'm Stephanie, and this is Art History Storytime. Today, I'd like to talk about nuns having way too much fun. No, not that. I'm talking about Gian Lorenzo Bernini's sculpture, Ecstasy of St. Teresa. There was some controversy as soon as the world lay eyes on Bernini's sculpture of a euphoric sister of the cloth. There was no way the Catholic Church or the public at large could fully ignore the message of physical pleasure transmitted to the viewer when looking at this piece. It's simply undeniable. Let's get this out of the way early. Look at her. It looks like she's having an orgasm. Okay there, it's been established. Nonetheless, it was still received with positivity and only a few critics in its time. Gian Lorenzo's son went on to write his father's biography, and whether biased or not, it mentions this particular sculpture was received well. Bernini chipped away at his life-sized marble work in a studio in Rome between 1647 and 1652. After those five years of hard work, when he was finally done, the sculpture was taken to the Church of the Descalced Carmelitas. This was the location that the sculpture's patron, Venetian Cardinal Federico Cornaro, had chosen as his burial chapel. Ecstasy of St. Teresa was to replace the existing image of St. Paul in ecstasy. Look, someone has to be in ecstasy, okay? St. Teresa of Avila was one of the founders of the Carmelite Order of the Catholic Church. You might have made the connection that the destination of the sculpture, the Church of the Descalced Carmelitas, bears part of that name. During her lifetime, she was very active as a writer, a monastic reformer, a mystic, and an all-around theologian. She wrote many books during her life on topics like mental prayer and spiritual development techniques. You could catch her writing all the time. She wrote an autobiography and often recorded detailed accounts of her personal spiritual practices, which offer an intact first-hand account of her mind leading some present-day researchers to speculate if she might have had possibly suffered from temporal lobe epilepsy. Unsurprisingly, she got backlash in her days for being a woman who spoke out and taught others. Because according to someone somewhere in the Bible, women should not teach. There will always be haters, but despite them, Teresa and her lifetime of devout work were still loved and appreciated by many. She was canonized 40 years after her death by Pope Gregory XVI and also given honors by the University of Salamanca in Spain. St. Teresa has been portrayed in many works of music, literature, drama, film, painting, and of course, sexy sculptures. Today, the sculpture lives at the Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria in Rome, and it's an epic sight to behold. First, we have St. Teresa and the angel piercing her heart front and center. Tucked under the elaborate eticule surrounding them is a skylight that allows the sun to naturally and radiantly illuminate the suspended golden rays from above. On either side of the spatial composition are high-relief, life-size portraits of the members of the Cornaro family. They witness the transcendent spiritual experience take place from their boxes as if watching a play. Their faces hint at awe and confusion as they debate among one another regarding what is happening. It's dramatic. It's Baroque. It's theater, baby. St. Teresa reclines on a cloud while an angel stands over her with an arm drawing back a golden spear moments before it pierces her heart. I'll let her explain it herself. From St. Teresa's autobiography, The Life of Teresa of Jesus, it reads, Beside me on the left hand appeared an angel in bodily form. He was not tall, but short and very beautiful. He appeared to be one of the highest ranks of angels who seemed to be on fire. In his hands I saw a great golden spear, and the iron tip there appeared to be a point of fire. He appeared to me to be thrusting it at times into my heart and to pierce my very entrails. When he drew it out, he seemed to draw them out also and to leave me all on fire with the great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan, and yet so surpassing was the sweetness of the excessive pain that I could not wish to be rid of it. The entire body contracts, neither foot nor arm can be removed. If one is standing at the time, one falls into a sitting position as though transported and cannot even take a breath. One only utters a few slight moans, not aloud, for that is impossible, but inwardly out of pain. No sense of anything but enjoyment without any knowledge of what is being enjoyed. And it goes on. This is her describing a mystic visionary experience she had and how that ecstasy felt to her. This was someone who was infused with the discipline, self-control, and constantly practiced methods to connect to the spiritual. 
This reminds me of Hamilton Morris consuming 5-MeO DMT while laying on a rocky riverbank in the Sonoran Desert, calling out, love, 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 repeatedly while he was tripping. He later described this experience as realizing that one can quantify love despite him being a cynical person. Minutes after his trip, he says, there's no shortage of it. You can just be very loving all the time and it's okay. With St. Teresa, Bernini was depicting the height of a mystical experience of love and God. Sometimes it's said that God is love, or love is God. And perhaps the humans have many ways to commune with this epic peak experience of love, and whatever one considers to be God. Oh, that's right, we were talking about a sexy sculpture. True, the focus of this was spirituality, not matters of the flesh, but Bernini chose to depict St. Teresa as young and beautiful even though her actual first mystical experience like this wasn't until she was 45 years old. And I'm just speculating, but with how much she wrote, I have a feeling that that detail was available to him. But he took creative liberties and sculpted a sensuous young woman feeling something. Her half-closed eyes are rolled upward a little and her head is thrown back. It points to an erotically influenced interpretation of divine love if you ask me. So what about it? On one hand, we have an ascetic type, St. Teresa, professing a transcendental spiritual experience and communing with God. And then we have an artist applying a filter of eroticism over the whole thing. I'd argue that love is the number one peak experience, frequency, energy, feeling, whatever you want to call it. I'd even argue that love is the whole point to being alive and to the human experience. Some might consider these two concepts as ones that shouldn't mix. But is it so bad? They are such different points on the love spectrum, but maybe their coming together can be a good thing from a different point of view. Either way, the artist here has found a way to viscerally communicate both his and St. Teresa's message to the viewer, no matter what walk of life they're coming from. And anyway, isn't that the whole point to art? To feel things? I'm curious to know what others think about this. Let me know down below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you find these moments and stories in history as interesting as I do. If you enjoyed this video, I'd deeply appreciate it if you'd hit that like button and subscribe for more art-related content.